right, welcome back. As you can see, that Tosi Oshukoya, Chief Executive Officer at Commercial Partners Asset Management, uh, is joining me right now virtually. Hello, Tosi, and welcome to the show. Morning, Nancy. Hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I hope you're also doing well, too. Um, Tosi, let, let, um, let's get started. In just a few days to the election campaigns, <laughs> I would like to know what your sentiments are. You mean we have a few months to ele <laughs> election campaign has actually started, um, mm. and everybody's looking forward to it. Um, and it's important not only to Nigerians but to a lot of communities, international communities, that are observing how the election would pan out. Um, it's very important to the investment climate because economic policies are meant to be you know, formulated when the new government resumes uh, office. So to us, we are particular about the philosophy and the ideology of whoever is going to come to power. Um, you would agree with me that the last, you know, um, regime, if you will, um, a lot of expectations, Nigerians, you know, local and abroad and foreign investors had a lot of expectations with regards to uh, the incumbent government, but those expectations were not met. So right now, the the level of uncertainty with regards to who is coming to power has really been heightened. And the risk emanating from that is investors shying away from putting their money into the Nigerian investment community. OK. Um, you, you've, you've mentioned the importance of uh, the forthcoming elections. But I would like to know what the sentiments are regarding perhaps what you've been hearing uh, around your community and how investors are feeling right, like right now. Is it a cautious uh, feeling or is it a feeling that, oh, Nigeria will get this election right and, you know, th there's nothing to fear? I think it's a cautious feeling, um, ideally, just like any other country. I mean, when America had their own election for um, two years ago, um, everybody was apprehensive. When Ghana had years a few weeks ago, a few people that had investments in Kenya, they were apprehensive as well. So typically what happens is when you are, you know, having an election year or pre-election year, you begin to see a lot of apprehension and people carefully will put their money into save assets or they put their money into cash. The reason why this election is very important is because I think that to some degree, Nigeria is actually uh, transiting to a more sophisticated election year. And what do I mean by that? I think we're beginning to see more participation and the election year is also taking a shape that we've not seen it before. Um, a bit of technology is being deployed to ensure that we see a free and fair election. So that gives some investors a, some sort of, you know, comfort that we could see a free and fair election because that is also very important. You don't want an election that is being marred by violence. So you need to ensure that the communications going out, not only to the locals, but to the foreign investors, is we are going to conduct this election in a very free and fair manner. However, having said that, investors naturally would shy away from the, the country pre-election year. And we've seen that happening in many election cycles in the last two or three years. In 2014, we saw a, a deplete in, you know, a depletion rather in, in investment into the country. In 2018, we saw the same thing as well. What happens typically is people would begin to move their country, their, sorry, their, their monies out of the country. And for those investors that are interested in your country, they will not come in until the election cycle has been completed. In 2014, for instance, we saw not only you know, foreign investors moving out of the country, but you also begin to see that your currency would suffer. In 2018, we experienced the same thing. Unfortunately for us here, 
in 2022, what has happened is because of the global um, situation with the fact that capital is scarce and expensive, we have not seen significant uh, foreign direct investment into the country. If you look at the two traditional asset classes, that is the fixed income market and the, the, the equities market, the fixed income market, particularly, we've not seen significant participation from foreign investors. So you would not see an outflow or a capital flight leaving that market. But if you look at the equities market, the equities market, the foreign, in, foreign investors' participation has waned over the years. I think it's just about 16% holdings, if you look at it, that for us, I don't think it's going to create a, any form of panic in that market. So you might not, you might not see a significant deposition of the Naira arising from capital flights. The capital flights that will leave this country, I'm sure some of them have left even before now. Some of them are still on the queue waiting for supply from the central bank. So by and large, from foreign investors or the foreign community, sentiment the sentiment is weak around election year however if you look at the local market the local market is a, is a little less uh, more concerned about where their money should go or if they should leave their money or take their money out of the country they are more concerned about who is coming to power like i said before what is the ideology what is the philosophy of whoever is coming to power. Mm. Does the person have a governance acumen or a business acumen? Is the person going to be an expansionary or a contractionary you know, type government? Those are the kind of questions that we begin to ask ourselves. And until we know um, who is going to come to power, you might see some investors, both local investors and foreign investors, shine away from either markets. OK. Uh, Tosi, I will come back to you to interrogate some of the things you have said uh, after uh, this break. You talked about the language. We'll come to that. We'll, you would also be talking about perhaps the ideology or uh, the perception that we will that we're seeing around, especially the top contenders uh, for the job. Talking about uh, the presidential election. But let's quickly take this break. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the program. Tosi Oshukoya, the Chief Executive Officer at Commercial Partners, uh, is still with me. Uh, Tosi, welcome back. L let's talk about the communication. Yes, let's talk about the communication, which is very key. You said it earlier, and I picked on it. Uh, what's your view about the communication, the language you've been getting from? At least, let's take a look at those that are, are vying for the top job in the country, the top Chief Executive Officer, I interviewed my guest last uh, Monday, the Chief Executive uh, 
officer of Wyoming uh, Capital and Partners. And he mentioned something that struck me. He said, and I quote him, he said, the three top contenders, the three top contenders are, you know, market friendly contender. They are market friendly. Uh, what do you think? And we shouldn't also just also look at the three top contenders because there are also other presidential, you know, candidates. Hello, Hello Nancy. Yes, Tosi, can you hear me? Tosi, can yes, you can hear you me? Can you repeat that again? Okay, I asked about the language. You, you mentioned communication earlier. What is your view about the communication that you're getting, especially from the top contenders for the topmost job in the country, which is the president? I interviewed my guest last week, the chief executive officer of Wyoming uh, Capital and Partners, and he did say that the top three contenders, Labor Party, um, APC, and PDP are market-friendly uh, candidates. What do you think? And we shouldn't also forget that we have other presidential candidates too. Yeah, well, again, like I said to you that um, communication is very important and the manner in which you disseminate those information and the level of credibility that people um, ascribe to those, you know, um, to those um, information. I think if you look at the three top contender, contenders, um, the most vocal out of the three is you would agree with me, is Peter will be right. And he has been able to highlight so many issues that we have in the country. And by so doing, what he's basically saying is, these are problems that need to be solved. And in highlighting them, is also backing them up with data. So the question is, if those data are credible data, you know, you have to do your homework. But the more important thing is the fact that he's communicating to the audience that these are the issues that need to be, to be you know, resolved. I'm not sure that the two other containers have done the same thing in analyzing those issues. So if you're talking about communication, communication is a strategy in not only um, being able to highlight, but also to offer solutions to those problems. I mean, what the investors uh, would like to hear or the investing community, both local and foreign, is the fact that you are able to identify those problems and not just identify them, but also profile solutions to them. They would like to hear from you what your agenda would be, you know, in resolving those problems. So for me, I think that um, that's a very smart one. And, and I think it's something that would give some investors some sort of comfort that, yes, someone at least understands what is happening and where the problems are and what are the, pro uh, the solutions that should be, you know, um, using in addressing those problems. Now, the next question will be around a guide to investment, because at this time, a lot of people, you said it earlier, that we are, it's a cautious mood. Every, every descending investor right now should be cautious uh, at this time. What is the guide to investment at this time? I think the guide to any form of investment is information and your ability to take a long-term view. Um, you would agree again that election cycle is short-lived. So what that means is it will come and go, but the market will still remain. If you observe, um, for instance, a few proxy that we could use, a typical proxy that we could use is in the, in the United States. S&P right now over the years, in the long term, has really outperformed in spite of you know, election cycles that they've witnessed over the decades. So what that means is that you need to continuously take a long-term view on certain or on certain traditional asset classes. If, for instance, you are looking into the property development, property development for me and for commercial partners, we believe that will continue to thrive irrespective of who comes to power because Nigeria is still in large deficit of housing, you know, uh, uh, accommodation. So that means that that market will continue to witness high demand. 
If you look at the equities market as well, the same thing, if you're able to identify selling stocks with good fundamentals, selling companies with good fundamentals, in the long run, you will be better off. Election in the next um, six months or seven months will be over. And what happens is people will now begin to look at what kind of investments can they you know, put their money in. Right now, what I think is happening is you begin to see a lot of people that are very cautious of where to invest. So they put their money in cash. If you're going to put your money in cash, you also need to understand what kind of cash you're putting your money in. Mm. Are you putting your money in a cash that is being you know, protected from currency depreciation? Um, if you are in dollar assets, I think that's very good because you need to understand that you need to diversify your portfolio from currency depreciation. So if you do that, you might get wind of selling assets that are very cheap at this moment. My advice is that if those assets are cheap and you are being advised by, by financial experts, I think that you should go into some of those assets and begin to pick them up. People will go into the market now to, to bag in hunts and look for assets that are very cheap, not only traditional asset classes, but you could look for ETFs as well, both um, you know, in the local market and in the foreign market. So the guide is very, very simple. First off, you need to speak to an expert, a financial expert that can take you through election cycles that have happened over the years and why this is not different and it's with common goal. So the question is what happens after that? You begin to see the market picking up after the election. And if you're not rightly positioned before the election, you might miss, you know, you might miss the boat. Mm. Let's take a look at some of the sectors that are likely to benefit uh, from, <laughs> from this election cycle. At least the, the first sector that comes to my mind is our sector, which is communication, broadcasting, media, for example. Uh, you know that a lot of people, at least in a few days' time, you start seeing jingles, you start seeing more interviews on politics and, and what have you. So my sector would definitely uh, benefit. But what other sectors do you think would benefit and how can a discerning and a savvy investor also take positions at this time if they are quoted uh, on the exchange? I mean, you're, you're clearly right about the telecom sector, the telecom sector, because a lot of communications, whether communications between the individuals or communication on a larger scale, they will go through, <laughs> through the telecom industry and you'll be paying up for that. In addition to that, you also need to look at pre-election and post-election. So the sectors that would, in, that would benefit from this pre-election would be the FMCG. You and I know that um, during that during the pre-election period, what happens basically is goods are being exchanged, all right, just to incentivize you know voters. And in doing that, the FMCG will benefit from that. What happens after the election? So it, typically after the election, and you could also say before the election, you might see the cement industry also benefiting because some of the uh, the the projects that are still outstanding pending that have not been completed the incumbent president presidency or incumbent government sorry government might want to quickly complete some of those projects just to show a good faith that yes they are being you know given this uh, responsibility and they are able to deliver on on uh, on their on their targets but post election you now need to begin to ask which of the sector will benefit post-election. I think that typically, if you have a government that is pro-economic development, you would still have the cement industry benefiting from this. If you have a government that is pro-economic development as well, and they're paying a lot of attention to SMEs, the small and medium scale enterprise, you would see um, some massive developments in the capital market because that would translate to more money to uh, to 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 a layman or to any you know, to any individual on the street because you see more economic activity translating to disposable income. So for 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 us, we believe that post election is very critical. You need to begin to ask yourself, and all of these would take a stem from which of these three contenders 
do you think would come to power? From what they've done in the past, whether in their own small you know, businesses or during governance, you are able to decipher who has a lot more business acumen or governance acumen to drive an economic activities that would take Nigeria away from the doldrums. So if you are able to decipher that and perhaps the person comes to power, you could potentially see which of the sector will benefit from this. I think the oil and gas will continue to benefit from this because we are not out of um, the woods yet with energy. I think that what would happen is energy will continue, especially with the Russian Ukrainian war, energy sector will continue to do well. I think the cement industry will continue to do well. I think the FMCG too will continue to do well. The banking for us, I think, will do well. And that's simply because we expect interest rates to continue to go up on the back of you know, inflationary pressure coming from not just only within Nigeria, but coming globally uh, or happening globally. Most central banks are concerned right now about the inflationary pressure. So, Nancy, for me, I think those four sectors would benefit post-election. Okay. Final question before you go. As a market person, as a businessman, and I know you have your ears to the ground among your colleagues and about, among foreign investors, even local investors, what issues do you think will shape this 2023 elections as campaigns are starting uh, in earnest? What should we be expecting uh, that will shape the 2023 elections that business people are looking at also? I think... First and foremost, um, the three contenders have been able to, you know, to carry or conduct themselves in in a manner that um, um, gives or puts Nigeria in a, in a good light in terms of, you know, uh, our election hiring process, in terms of the sophistication within election, and I must applaud the three of them for doing that. I think. Areas that Nigerians would like to see them address, any one of them that comes into power would be one on security. That would shape Nigeria's you know, future going forward. Then they also need to address the infrastructural you know, deficit that we have in this country. Nigeria, unfortunately, is moving backwards when other countries are moving forward. We need to do something about that. We also need to do something about our debt sustainability as well. I think we're spending a lot of money on debt and the the level of borrowing we have because there have been a lot of you know thoughts and discussions around our debts to gdp so the problem is not about our debt level but the problem is about channeling that debt to the real sector to its development purposes so if you're borrowing for governance and you're borrowing for consumption it's not a good way to spend your borrows you must spend those monies you borrowed into the real sector, into the development sector, such that the future returns from those um, developments. We pay, we pay the, the debts back. And if you're able to position yourself better for foreign investors to come into the country, for your FDIs and your APIs to increase, you would, re, you would understand that in the, in the near to medium term, what would happen is that you will be able to generate enough money to pay down on your debt level. So I think that those are the areas that they need to pay a lot more attention to. Then more importantly, the policy formation is also very, very important. PIB, for, PIB, for instance, has been formulated for some time now, all right, and has been signed and passed into law. But We've not seen massive investment in that sector. We've not seen execution of those letters that have been put together in the PIB you know, uh, document. That has to be done. If they can address all of these issues, um, we would see a Nigeria for a better future. Okay. Thank you very much, Tosi, for your insights today. Let's talk again soon. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic week. Thank you, Nancy. All right, I've been uh, speaking with Tosi Oshukoya, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Commercial Partners and Assets Management. We've been talking about what issues we should be expecting as campaigns will soon start in a few uh, days. And if you're a savvy investor, 
If you're someone holding cash right now, where should you put your cash? So I hope you got a few insights from the interview. That's the much we can take on today's edition of the program. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to join us on all our social media platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Moneyline with Nancy at TV. I am Nancy Naji. Be the best you can be and be that change that you want to see. Bye for now. Hello, the general.